Dr. O hails from Honolulu, Hawaii. He re received his Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology at Boston University in 1993. He graduated from Boston University School of Medicine with a Doctor of Medicine degree in 1998 and completed a family medicine residency at DeWitt Army Community Hospital in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. He then completed a faculty development fellowship at Madigan Army Medical Center, where he additionally received his Master's of Public Health degree at University of Washington School of Public Health. He completed a sports medicine fellowship at the prestigious National Capital Consortium in Bethesda, Maryland, and received a certificate of added qualification in sports medicine. He was then selected as the Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Commander of Clinical Services at Martin Army Community Hospital where he was instrumental in standardizing the heat injury policy for the Maneuver Center of Excellence. He has published on identifying and quantifying risk factors for exertional rhabdomyolysis, heat injuries, and exercise-associated hyponatremia prevention, recognition, and management in the military. He is also a past president of the Uniformed Services Academy of Family Physicians. He will be speaking today about exertional rhabdomyolysis. All right, let me go ahead and make him the presenter here. And so you'll have a screen pop up asking you to be the presenter. Yep, I got a screen and should I? Show, yes. Change presenter. Yep. Okay. Show. All right, Michelle. Let me. I might have to sign in again because it, it it had to do the um the <laughs> granting the camera access. Let me see if I will, let me switch it back. I switched it back to me and I can switch it back to oh, you. Oh, I see it. Okay. Back up. It. Got it. Okay. Got it. All right. Do you see my screen at all? It says we're waiting to view. Yes. Yep. Your screen is up now. Okay. Great. Excellent. Yes, we are making good, great progress. We're making progress. Okay. Okay, so whenever you're ready, are you, are you ready for uh, yes. ready to start? I'll let you take it away. All right, questions for you, um, Michelle, before we begin. Is there a chat on the side? I know there's a yes. lot of participants, and I see uh, a chat. So if I type something here, is it just to the organizers or the panelists or both? That will go, it depends on which one you categorize it to. You can send it to the entire audience or you can send it to the organizers and panelists. And what I'm gonna do is I'll moderate the question bar. So if okay. they, most of the time during it, there might just be questions about audio or visual type questions. And then as we get further along, there tends to be the clinical ones and I'll bring those up at the end. Okay, all right. And uh, you guys are seeing my slides, that's good. And well, let's get, go ahead and get started then. Okay, everything good still, Michelle? I'm just waiting on it to go into the slideshow mode. Yes, you look fantastic. Good to go here. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate your patience for the technical difficulties. Um, but hopefully that this time we'll, we'll take a look at exertional rhabdomyolysis and just kind of go through some um, real life cases. Uh, I have to do this disclaimer since I still belong to the military and this is uh, no official policies from the Uniform Services Department of Defense of the United States government. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, Relieve has also asked me to um, mention if I do have any other conflicts of interest and I do not have any conflicts that interested in this in this topic, but I'd be happy to take some money after this presentation if you are willing to give it to and donate to me. 
And that is a joke and I can't hear anybody laugh. So anyway, so, all right. So we're gonna talk about uh, this and hopefully this video comes out. I want you to watch this video. This is the CrossFit Games in 2015. And in 2015, it was in California. I think it was in Carlsbad, California. And in Carlsbad, California, it was a relatively warm day. This is in the mid 80s. And this is the, um, the second day of the tournament. And it was basically uh, one of the workouts called Murph. And Murph, if you look on the top of the screen, it says uh, one mile run. So you do the one mile run and you do the 100 uh, pull ups consecutively. And then you move on to 200 push ups and then another 300 squats. And then you finally finish off with a one mile run. And at the end of that event, you are um, still, you're wearing a vest. So you're wearing about a 20 pound vest throughout this whole event. And so the elite athletes will finish this about 40 minutes um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a great day. And this is a little bit of a hot day. So I want you to watch this video as the women compete um, in this event called Murph. So here we go. So as you watch this, this is Kara Webb. Watch Kara Webb. And then towards the end, we're gonna see um, Car Web come in at the end, and then the video will end, and we'll talk a little bit about it.
All right, here's Kara Webb coming in the back. You can see her in the back in the cap in the green. All right. Yeah. So that was a very interesting year in 2015. There was a lot of issues with um, heat type injuries and they, they don't mention it, what happened at the end, but they do mention that Kara Webb did have a heat stroke and then any Thor's daughter is unclear what happened. She was not able to finish that event uh, of the Murph. And then she eventually um, um, did not qualify, did not had to pull out of the 2015 games. So lots of interesting things of, of exertional rhabdo. I really believe any Thor's daughter probably had some exertional rhabdo event. We can talk a little bit more about what Carl Webb had. She had a heat stroke. She actually continued on in day, day three and finished fifth actually in the CrossFit games. So whatever you feel about that, um, that's an interesting concept, but uh, we're not gonna talk about heat stroke today. So here are our learning objectives. We're gonna talk about uh, exertional rhabdomyolysis. And really the first step is to define it. And I think there's been some confusion in how to define even exertional rhabdo. Uh, we're gonna try to find one resource on exertional rhabdo. We're gonna look at three specific cases of exertional rhabdo and the risk factors. And really this goes together, learning the terrible T's and risk factors of exertional rhabdo. And then finally, we'll briefly touch upon the return to play criteria. So let's take a look at the case and the case number one. Um, and this is a compilation of what we see often in the military. And this is something that we see um, quite often. I've had a lot of experience um, hospitalizing our active duty members with rhabdomyolysis. And this is a pretty typical case scenario um, that I see. So let's talk about this 21 year old active duty service member um, and he's black. Uh, he's two days ago, he had a tough workout and now has some uh, lat pain with and some quad pain. This was his workout of that day, uh, 20 pull-ups, 30 push-ups, 40 sit-ups, and 50 air squats. And he did that for five rounds, so five rounds. After that, he thought he was pretty smoked, but he kept pushing because he was a little bit overweight and wanted to lose some weight. Uh, if you asked him, Previously, what his previous workout was, he was uh, did a five mile run and 100 sit ups and 100 push ups a couple of days ago. And if he asked his medical medical history, he has no significant medical history, no surgeries, he has uh, no medications and and denies any supplements. So that's a pretty typical case. And the question is, how do you define and diagnose um, exertional rhabdo? So the first thing to understand is when you Define exertional rhabdo. A lot of people can confuse exertional rhabdo pain with the pain of DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. We all worked out, and next couple of days, you know, maybe it's difficult to move some parts of the body that you worked out because you are sore. Uh, and that's delayed onset muscle soreness, and that usually lasts about three to five days, sometimes up to seven. The difference between exertional rhabdo and DOMS is maybe semantics, but it's really significant per or persistent muscle pain. And that's, you have to have that. There's a lot of questions on what that means, but you also have to have some laboratory evidence of muscle breakdown. And that is really the pure definition of exertional rhabdo. So if you have significant muscle pain, but never get to see anybody and never do anything differently, then I'm not sure if that really can be defined as exertional rhabdo. But say you, you're concerned about it and then you do see somebody or your trainer or as your athletic trainer, you get concerned about an athlete and tells them to see a physician to get tested. These are the two tests that you need to have. You need to have a UA with positive blood and no red cells seen on microscopy. The blood 
um, is a positive test for urine myo myoglobin, and that demonstrates that there's myoglobin spilled into the urine, which demonstrates there's some muscle breakdown that overwhelms the kidneys. The second thing you can have is a CK, and that's probably the more typical things that you can see with exertional rhabdo. So if you have a CK of five times upper limits of normal, that also cinches the diagnosis of rhabdo as long as you have the muscle pain in, in the side in the setting of exercise. So that's it. It's, it's not complex, but you have to get the laboratory evidence to determine that it is rhabdo. And we'll talk a little bit about complexities as it moves forward, but this is really the diagnosis. So again, you gotta have the muscle pain, you have to have some laboratory evidence, whether it's a CK value that's five times upper limits than normal, or a UA with blood but no red cells seen. And typically I use an easy number if it's greater than a thousand plus muscle pain and setting of exercise, you have rhabdomyolysis, okay? So that's it. The other thing that's important to understand is the exercise history. And as athletic trainers, you'll be really um, in tune with what kind of workouts and what kind of regimens that they are doing. And the history is key because the whole mantra of too much, too fast, too soon really, really is important to know. It's how, how much exercise that they've done, um, how intense was that workout, and then did they go too soon into re before they actually fully recovered that muscle group? Um, the other thing that um, will get you a good history is the eccentric exercises. So eccentric exercises are basically a lengthening contraction of the muscles with lengthening. And so specifically, um, air squats are a typical one. Biceps negatives are another one that they use in research to induce rhabdomyolysis. So those are two kind of typical workouts of eccentric workouts that can produce um, uh, not only DOMS, but uh, exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. And then of course, if you have a history of exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis, then that's actually a key risk factor. Okay, and here's the interesting thing is that we all think that it's associated with heat injury, but really a pure exertion of rhabdo has nothing to do with heat injury. And there's a lot of confusion about that. And we're, we're currently looking at uh, research and papers, looking at the differentiation between rhabdomyolysis that comes after a heat stroke or a heat injury versus uh, rhabdomyolysis that's caused by exercise. And I don't want to go into the nuances here because that takes a little bit more time, but you got to understand that this is not technically a heat injury. You can have pure exertional rhabdo without any episodes of heat, okay? Okay, so this is case one, and um, this is where hopefully the chat will work here. You can put it in the chat. Uh, I couldn't figure out the polls fast enough, but in this case one, so you suspect exertional rhabdomyolysis and send them for an ASAP CK level. Assuming there's no high-risk markers, at which CK level would you consider outpatient management? Um, so these are the four choices, or five choices, and I'm gonna give you some time to hopefully uh, look at that, and maybe it's in, it'll appear in the chat, and, or maybe Michelle can tell me what are some of the majority of people mentioning. So I'm gonna just give you guys a, a second to read the questions and then answer it in the chat boxes. We have started having people respond. They're responding into the question uh, tab, and it's been predominantly ease. Ease and Edward. Okay. Yeah, you know, interesting is, um, thank you, Michelle. Um, the answer is not E. The answer is going to be um, C. And we'll go through that piece. And this is, again, another, another misconceptions of inpatient versus outpatient management. 
So let's take a look at this. And you, you're, you may not be able to um, be in the front end of the admissions, right, in terms of when you admit these people into the emergency room or not and from the emergency room. But in, in all essence, you'll be sending it to the hospital and they're going to get to decide. And there's a lot of discrepancies in, um, in terms of who to admit and who not to admit. Um, the topic of exertional rhabdo has not been studied very well. We're getting a lot more data recently, and the Uniform Services University's CHAMP guidelines has done a lot of things to kind of standardize it in the military approach. And I got to say, even in the military, uh, despite the standardized clinical practice guidelines, we still have variability of care. So this is what, um, what we suggest um, regarding an admission criteria or no, no admission criteria. So first, if you have rhabdo and it is less than five times upper limits normal of less than a thousand, it's probably not rhabdo, okay? So it's probably more delayed onset muscle soreness and it's just, hey, it probably doesn't fit the research criteria. So we wouldn't even call that rhabdo. Now, if you have CK greater than 20,000, it's automatic. We should consider inpatient therapy for the um, IV renal protection and to lower the CK level and protect the kidneys. If it's less than 20,000 and there's no other high risk markers, this is where you can consider outpatient management and it's based on some trauma literature on trauma um, related rhabdo. And really less than 20,000, there's little risk of renal, renal disease or renal failure. And so that's why we feel that this is pretty safe when we can do it as long as there's no other high risk markers. So some of the high risk markers is if you can get concerned about compartment syndrome, if there's any evidence of acute kidney injuries in laboratory, if you're peeing uh, Coca-Cola urine and dark urine and myoglobin, then that is absolutely a higher risk. If you have some metabolic uh, electrolyte abnormalities in your initial labs, then it, it is a little bit more increased risk. Sickle cell trait we'll talk a lot about, about in, the, in the next few cases. That is a high risk marker and should be an inpatient and if there's no patient follow-up, so you, you're gonna lose this patient to follow-up, then that's a, a, another high-risk marker. So bottom line, when you say 20,000, as long as you don't have any high-risk markers, uh, you can consider outpatient management. Okay, when, when you do outpatient management, and you may be able to do this, right, as you are athletic trainers and working with your team physician, if you are seeing a patient and they get discharged or discharged from the emergency room, uh, you can actually do this as an outpatient. Um, there's actually been a lot of studies, some studies looking at a wide range of CKs being treated as an outpatient. And Randy Eichner is on the other side of, uh, of this argument saying that really pure exertional rhabdo probably does not have a high morbidity. There's not a lot of high levels of death uh, or concerns about that. So an outpatient management can be done at higher levels. But really, 20 to 50,000 may be reasonable, but we're going to stick with 10 to 20 is probably very reasonable. There was a basic uh, study, um, basic training study done by Kenny et al. This is a little bit older by now, but he basically took all these um, basic training uh, recruits that got into the military and they're doing basic training. And they found um, uh, CK values 25 times to up to 50 times upper limits of normal without any evidence of. Uh, exertional rhabdo. So if you think about it, that could be 10 to 15,000 CK and they're just running around doing things um, that the drill sergeants have telling them to do without actually having some injury. So that is, uh, that was, that's kind of what we do use to kind of change that concept that every elevation is not um, exertional rhabdo. So when you see these patients, so, so they may have a CK of 15,000 and they're released for outpatient management, the goal is the similar to do as an inpatient is to renal protect, and we use just regular water or fluids every six hours. The goal is roughly the same as inpatient therapy is 200 milliliters an hour of output. When I release patients out of the emergency room, we give them one of those hospital urinals, and their goal is to pee in a, in a jug and to fill that every six hours, right? And that will give you about a liter of, of output in six hours. And so if there's poor compliance um, and it's not reliable, you need to readmit them. Uh, the key important part is the 72 hour follow-up to make sure they're doing better and they're actually getting improvement from their muscle pain and actually um, not uh, going backwards on their water consumption.
Okay, and, and that's that's really simple. One liters of fluids every six hours. The goal would be a roughly about a liter in a, a six hours while awake. Okay, so here's your task. I'm gonna give you guys a minute and uh, just to keep you guys on, ta on task. Um, you have a one minute to search and Google search uh, Warrior Heat HPRC. And I'm gonna give you the, the CHAMP guidelines so you can have this as your resource for the next patient you see with exertional rhabdo. And so I'm gonna give a minute and then I'll return from that minute and hopefully people have gotten this. Some people are quick Google searchers, some people are not. So we'll give them the whole 60 seconds. All right, we're getting to that 60 seconds. So hopefully you've got that. If you hit that clinical practice guideline for exertional rhabdo, we just updated it. We probably updated it probably um, about a month or two ago and it has some good information and the algorithms are pretty good to follow if you have any questions or concerns about um, exertional rhabdo. And this is probably uh, one of the best resources out there. We're hopefully planning to publish uh, another uh, version of this in uh, current meds sports reports sometime soon, but that should come out hopefully within the next three to six months, okay? But this is what it's gonna be based on and we provide uh, similar guidance um, from a non-military perspective. Okay, all right, so let's look at case two. So we're gonna talk about a case of Murph and in your handouts, and what I gave you was an article written by uh, Dr. Mimi Raleigh and Fran O'Connor group over from the Uniform Services and really um, looked at a cluster of rhabdo caused by MRF. Like I said, this is what MRF is and it's a, it's a popular Memorial Day workout. Um, and it's, it's a difficult workout, especially if you haven't done it before, right? And I would be caution anybody to do this workout if they've never done this, because uh, it is a smoker. All right, let's talk about this cluster of rhabdo. Um, in this article, they looked at 44 ROTC cadets um, at, at the U.S. University in 2015. Um, this is actually a real live um, event in clusters. They had to do a mandatory exercise test called the MRF. And as you can see, that's what the MRF consisted of. They did not have to wear the vest. The picture on the right is from Shaw Air Force Base, and this is just a uh, this is not the case, but it's actually the uh, soldier members or service members doing the MRF in honor of Memorial Day to memorialize the fallen uh, service members in wars. So that's a pretty tradition uh, across the military and across a, a lot of other places. And so you may have even participated in the MRF yourself. But um, this is a mandatory exercise test. So this is a ROTC cadets. It, in 2015 and they were told that they must do this and then approximately 24 to 72 hours after this test 11 of them developed exertional rhabdo and had to be hospitalized so a pretty significant event and a lot of changes happened this is when the concern was hey was there something done to these ROTC candidates that uh, provoked this clusters of exertional rhabdo so the paper looked at what did they do is they surveyed the cadets. So 35 of 44 cadets agreed to it. Um, they weren't forced to the survey. Uh, this is all voluntary. And what they said is that there were um, two ways to do the MRF. One, you can just do it individually and 25 of those did the full MRF individually or 10 of them did it actually as teams of three. So you could have three people and they would participate um, probably in the run. You can split up the 100 pull-ups, the push-ups, and the air squats as a team of three, and then you can all finish with the run. So that's kind of what usually teams do when they do the MRF. And the interesting thing was that when they looked at these surveys, they didn't really find anything. 
They didn't find anything that pushed these cadets into rhabdo. There was no difference of those cadets who had rhabdo versus those who had developed rhabdo. So the question is, what's going on? Why do some get rhabdo doing the same event and some do, don't? It wasn't really um, fitness levels because most of these cadets were already pretty fit. Some of these cadets who developed rhabdo actually had done MRF before and had experience with MRF. So the question is, what's going on? And if you've read the article, it's really interesting. And I, I'm going to um, talk about the clusters a little bit more. But let me go to this quote that they said, that these cadets were led to believe that their scores in the mandatory exercise test would directly affect their professional military careers in assigned vocational fields, making them more likely to push harder. And so that's what their hypothesis were on these clusters of rhabdomyolysis is that there's something going on there that would push them beyond their capabilities, even if they've already done this before. And so let's look at back at the clusters of rhabdo again. So let's review the literature. In this article, if you read it, they did a really nice review on the clusters of exertional rhabdo and figure out what was it. So I'm gonna just do a highlight of that article. Eight volleyball players from Texas Women's University. Uh, this was under, they had to go through a fitness testing. Uh, 13 football players, and you have the article that I sent you from the University of Iowa, did a sled pull and a back squat time session in the off season. And we're gonna, we're gonna um, unpack that a little bit more. Uh, the third one was an across players at Un University of North Carolina. They did three sets of bicep curls, but this was their first weight training event that they've done uh, before the season. Uh, seven swimmers at University of South Carolina, uh, preseason push-ups and squats for 10 minutes. Um, 12 high school camp football players at camp, they did a chair dip intervals with push-ups, right? So you do chair dips, uh, you do intervals, you mix it with push-ups, and it's, it's in a round robin circuit training uh, with timed. And so the interesting thing about this high school football player was it, they had to do this test. This was preseason, and this was probably um, demonstrated who's going to make the team or not, okay? So the question to you all, and I know I don't see that in the chat, but if, if you guys want to throw things out in the chat, that's great. What is the, the underlying theme, and what is it that pulls these two together? And it's unclear, right? There's, this, there's not a lot of lecture about. Let, let me just give you the Rob O version of what we think that's going on here. Um, and there's two things that I see that comes out all the time. And one of the things is called the time test. So if you had to do something for time and it me is a meaningful event, like something is there that pushes you beyond your limit, that, that is another risk factor for exertional rhabdo, that time test. So if you have that extra, uh, hey, I have to finish it under whatever, 10 minutes, uh, or I'm gonna blank, you fill in the blank, I'm gonna fail ROTC cadet, I'm gonna uh, blank, lose my scholarship, blank, whatever, then they're gonna push themselves to the limit. The other thing that we can think of is the, the um, leader, right? is the leader pushing them to beyond their muscle capability. Because in all reality, if, if you're exhausted and fatigued, you're gonna stop or slow down, even if it's timed, right? But if there's something pushing you to say that, hey, I need to finish because somebody's pushing me to finish, then that is something that may cause issues. So for example, if you look at the high school football players at camp, if the football coach said that, hey, this, if you're working out and you're doing, you're not doing well, this could be a, a cut, right? And therefore, someone's going to push themselves more. Uh, the other thing that, that, that we look at is uh, during the season or off season, is it something that's uh, the load previously to the season to start like a preseason event where they're not used to the load, okay? So those are the things that, that, that I want you to start thinking through and marinating over as I don't even know if football is going to start this year or if some are going to start or fall sports. Who knows what's going to happen? But trust me, when you go back from COVID and you're trying to get back into exercise, you're not going to be in condition. So the question is, do you push them hard fast or do you slowly graduate and move them up? 
And obviously we know the answer is, is slow graduated training, right? And preseason training and all those things. But the question is, is the coach gonna push them to a point where you're gonna have a risk for rhabdo? So I'm gonna call these the terrible T's. So the terrible T's is, hey, it's a group setting. We have some pressure to perform. It's a time testing. Think, think about the preseason and off season, right? And there's that University of Iowa case with the football players. If you read that article, that was done in the off season. They finish their bowl game. They had a three week winter break. They then uh, went at three weeks back into no football training. And then finally they're in January, they're starting their first training and the coach just killed them, right? And next thing you know, these highly trained athletes who supposedly do a preconditioning program before they came in, uh, they all got smoked and 13 of them landed in the hospital, right? And so that was a significant um, event for the coach, but also for these players. And then also individual factors. Is the, is the training load different than they have been used to? And then finally, are they competitive? And you, we all know those athletes who are extra competitive, you know, in the NCAA settings, we are pretty competitive. In the high school setting, we can be competitive. But you have those extra competitive people who will push themselves just to win. And those are the people who will potentially get the risk factors for having rhabdo. All right. So I'm going to summarize this as too much, too much exercise, then the, the load of the exercise, too fast, that they've done it with intensity and because of their competitiveness or their pressure to perform or it's too soon. They didn't give their muscles enough time to recover. And then finally, I'm gonna add two things to too much, too fast, too soon, is the time testing. Be careful about this time testing. And this is, a, I think, a critical risk factor that is under-recognized this time. And then finally, I'm gonna call the other T is the tyrannical trainer. The leadership of the coaches, the leaderships of what you do um, to for these exercises, for these uh, kids, these cadets, uh, these athletes, whatever um, level of competition you're on, you got to take it slow and gradually build their capacity before game time, right? And so that preseason is exactly why they have preseason. And so you, we see a lot of injuries from preseason um, because of the conditioning piece. And this is going to be critical, especially as we move into the fall season. Okay, let's look at uh, one more case. And then we'll start wrapping it up. Uh, this is a 19-year-old football player, black male, running five timed 300 meter intervals in preseason conditioning tests for college football. This is a, a real case. This is your other article that I sent you of the sickle cell trait. Uh, ambient temperature was greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This guy struggles during the last 50 meters of the fifth sprint. He collapses after the finish. So he did finish, but he's unable to stand. He does have complaints, some cramps and profuse sweating. Uh, the difference here, he's fully conscious. He's conscious, he's talking to you, he's talking to the coaches, he's talking to the athletic trainer. Uh, they initiated cool towels and oral fluids initiated. That was exactly the right thing to do. And then next thing you know, he's unable to stand. He's taken to the athletic trainer, so he has stretcher. Uh, the athletic trainer did the right thing, called the EMS. The EMS started some fluids. And then after that, that recovery that did not happen, the EMS transported him to the hospital about an hour after his initial collapse. If you look at the vital signs in the track, it was 6'6", 358. So that's pretty standard for probably, I think it's the offensive lineman, right? Uh, 147 over 80 is the blood pressure. His heart rate was a little tachycardic at 110. His respiratory rate was 22 and his temperature was normal. It was a 99 degrees Fahrenheit and it was a rectal temperature. So it's really, really important to know. This is not a heat stroke nor was it a heat injury. Um, this is uh, past medical history, had asthma, he had sickle cell trait, but no prior heat injuries, no history of muscle disorders. Um, he had no surgery, no medication, no over-the-counter medication, no supplements that he, he talks about, no alcohol, no tobacco. So this is a pretty clean case, and this is, um, this is clearly a significant event. Uh, as it, they continued, he had a, the acute pain. He was unable to lift his foot, his leg, and limb movements in his arms. His abdomen was tender, but without any significant rebound. He was admitted to the hospital. Take a look at his CK. His initial CK was 561. Um, and that's, if you look at it, that's normal, right? And then 
Uh, day two, his CK spiked to 468,545. Um, that's significantly elevated. His creatinine is 1.9. On day two, his creatinine spiked to 4.8. His kidneys are failing him. They had to do daily dialysis to keep his kidney functions normal. And then finally, after 17 days, he was discharged from the hospital. So this is a significant event. This is called ECAST. And this is something that you should all be aware of as athletic trainers, as you're working in um, the NCAAs or the high school setting, that this is something that's important to recognize because this will cause death. Exertional rhabdos is, is, is common and, and, and to, to recognize, but with ECAST, if you do not recognize this early, this can cause significant disaster and early morbidity and mortality. If you look at the NCAA, they, they actually screened for a single cell trait in 2010. This is universally screened. Um, the United States Navy and the Air Force, they screen universally, but not the United States Army. So this still remains controversial whether you screen them or not. And the question is, what do you do with that sickle cell uh, test if it's positive to your athlete? Do you treat them any differently? And that's, that's the big concerns that we have, right? Especially in this time of um, uh, social justice and racial disparities, and as you can see, this happens a lot in blacks. And do we treat them differently than we do in other athletes? Or do we let them do whatever they need to do to perform and do well? And so this is um, can be still controversial and is still controversial. So let's look at some of the, um, the research on this and look at Division I football players. This is by Kim Harmon in the British uh, Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, the sickle cell trait. One in 827 versus one in 30,000 risk of death during exertion. So 37 times higher than athletes without sickle cell trait. And that, that one of, was the, one of the reasons why we, um, the NCAA decided to screen it. And then the U.S. Army study, another really interesting thing that came out not too long ago is uh, if they looked at all the, the military studies, the sickle cell trait did not actually increase risk of death, but it did increase risk of exertion or rhabdo. So, so the question is, what is it? Is it the sickle cell trait increasing risk of exertional rhabdo then causing death? Or is it something else differently? And it's unclear at this time. But since this is a talk about exertional rhabdo, I'm going to postulate that exertional rhabdo is an increased risk for sickle cell trait um, and those with sickle cell trait. And if you do have exertional rhabdo with a sickle cell trait, that is a high risk event. And that needs to be transported to the hospital immediately. OK. So here's question two. So Michelle will have to be the, the moderator here. ECAST, exertional rest, rhabdo, and exertional heat stroke, that's EHS, share many similar qualities, which is true of ECAST. It helps differentiate from exertional rhabdo and exertional heat stroke. So I'm going to give you a minute to work through that, and then you can throw it in the chat boxes to see what the popular answers are. Ready, set, go. All right, so um, let's see what, what they have. Okay, there's predominantly Bs, followed by a couple of As and a D. Predominantly Bs and right. Yeah, B is the right answer. So uh, this happens primarily with short, intense workouts, and this is maximal exertion. We'll go, let's go through the reason why we think that happens. So let's go through the, the recognition piece. So I'm going to give you um, a mnemonic, and this is something I made up. So uh, don't don't uh, don't make too much feedback unless this really sucks. 
but this is a conscious cramp like collapse. So the difference between exertional heat stroke and ECAST is their loss of consciousness. So if they are conscious, is more likely to be ECAST. If they have any mental status changes, is more likely to be exertional heat stroke. Okay, so that's really key and critical. So yes, they are talking to you. You can still cool them. A little ice is not going to hurt anybody, right? But they should be talking to you. So they should have a be conscious. It's going to be cramp-like and it's severe pain. But when you examine them, it's not going to be like those typical cramps you see in patients who are really cramping, right? You can see muscles fasciculation, they're screaming, and it hurts like all get out, but it's going to be flaccid. So it's going to be odd. So it's going to, you know, look at this um, this athlete and say, this is kind of odd, okay? And severe pain out of proportion. And because of the pain, they're going to collapse. And it usually happens in the large muscle groups, okay? Really the quads and the, the, the uh, hamstrings and the back muscles. And the sickling worsens, and if you think about why sickling happens, we talk about the H's, right? If you're hypoxic, you get a little bit more sickles. If you have acidosis, you have a little bit more sickling event. If you have hyperthermia, if it's hot, if it's warm, if you have fever, you have a little more sickling. If you're dehydrated, you get a little more sickling. So if you have these H's, right, then you have a more setup for risk of sickling, even if you just have a trait. So here's a theory, is a theory, and again, this is really brand new to really understand it. We think high intensity, maximal effort with minimal recovery, right? So that's high intensity, you're gonna have lots of lactic acids build up. You're gonna be hypoxic, right? Because you're not gonna have any muscle, uh, oxygen to those muscles, right? That's the whole thing about anaerobic workouts. You're gonna be hyperthermic because you're gonna build in that, that metabolic load. And then if you have a little recovery and it's a hot day, and you're a little bit dehydrated, bam, that's a recipe for ECAST, especially with a sickle cell trait, right? So this is exactly what we need to look at. And now, if you look at a terrible tease, it absolutely goes into that terrible tease. If it's too fast, too much, too soon, especially with those intense workout, if it's a time test like that football player, right? You're doing this to pass their initial cuts, right? You're doing it because the trainer is pushing you and not letting you off your butt because you're 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 being pushed hard. That's when you're going to have the E cast. So here's the mnemonic: the H's and T's will help you see the conscious cramp-like collapse of E cast. Okay, the hypoxemia, the lactic acidosis, the hyperthermia, the dehydration will help you see the e, uh, the conscious collapse of E cast. Okay, so this is a chart that we made uh, in conjunction with Dr. O'Connor. This is uh, from the Slack. Uh, we published this in 2015. I don't know if this is the recent um, uh, um, book that you have, but it's basically, it's called The Quick Questions of Heat-Related Illness and Hydration. It's a, uh, a National Athletic Trainer Association publication in 2015 in Slack, okay? So we, we published this as how do we differentiate between exertional heat illness and exertional sickling event. It just gives you the, the guidance here. The ones in the red here um, gives you what I think is critical to differentiate. Uh, exertional rhabdo a few days after an event, exertional heat stroke, right? You're going to be confused. You're going to have a temp, uh, core body temperature or rectal temp of 104 or higher, right? And the treatment is rapid, rapid cooling. The difference between for um, sickle cell trait, you're going to have the, the terrible T's, especially with the maximal maximal uh, time testing. And then it's really, really the rapid recognition and early transport is going to be critical because we've had some deaths associated with the ECAST. Okay, so this is a good chart to have. If you have the book, it's a variation of this book. I added a little bit more on the types of exercise and the risk factors of exercise. Okay, so that's a whirlwind. We're wrapping up. We got a, a few more minutes, and I do want to spend some time if you have any questions um, to answer. But um, first thing is return to play. Again, not a lot, of, a lot of evidence in the literature. It's kind of a swag a lot of times. But what I do is literally, if they get admitted into the hospital, you know, you got to get to see them within 72 hours, and then there's no physical exertion until at least a week or two from the inciting event. Then, really, to me, you have to have a CK level checked. Um, you have to wait until it's under a thousand, and because that will give you the relatively normal CK. 
right? Once it's under a thousand, you can become with a gradual return to light, light, light exercise, light intensity, a moderate type intensity exercise, nothing high intensity, nothing especially with that muscle of, of um, injury. Then you start slowly increases tolerated, but only increases tolerated until your CK really entirely normalizes. So generally, I would say wait till under 400. Um, in black uh, in individuals, it may be higher. So you may never get to the under 250 or 200 like that University of Iowa test uh, uh, that University of Iowa football study did. Um, but you want to wait to definitely under 400, and that will get most of the people to pretty normal. Once you get to normal, then you have to make sure their muscles are normal so they don't have any pain. You cannot have any pain in the muscle of injury. So if it's a bicep, if it's quads, they should have no pain in that air, uh, that that um, muscle of origin. And then once it normalizes, then you can use um, sports-specific return to play guidance. You can use the quads, you can use the biceps, whatever it is, but go obviously slow. Don't be the too fast, too soon, and um, too much um, when you're trying to recover from CK um, elevations. Okay, and that's it. Uh, I appreciate your time. This is um, over when we're doing an Army 10 miler. This is Teddy Roosevelt. He has a pretty big head. Um, and hopefully we get to see Teddy during the Nats games. Um, but unfortunately, the Nats game is really boring with those cardboard cutouts. So uh, this is my fellowship group back in the days. And yes, I do look a lot younger. And that's me next to Teddy Roosevelt uh, on the left-hand side of him. All right. Appreciate your, your time and attention. Uh, hopefully you learned a few things and um, I will turn it over to Michelle. Perfect. All right. So we already had some questions coming in. The first one comes from Mary and she asks if there are some warning signs that athletic trainers can look for for rhabdomyolysis besides the blood and urine test in terms of how, how can we identify that it's not just DOMS that's going to be developing. That is absolutely a great question because I feel like, because I'm a big CrossFitter, as you can see, and um, uh, I'm sort of like every day I do CrossFit, and I always wonder what my CK level was. Again, it's it's the athlete, right? And so you have to have a high suspicion. Is, is this typical for your athlete? And you know your athlete's the best. And if this is, hey, they can't even do anything, or you see like a swollen uh, biceps on the right side versus the left, and he's complaining of it, and you can't straighten it out, then I would get concerned. So it, it has to be a high index of suspicion, but also you have to know your athlete. If your athlete says, no, this is, this, is, this is fine. I am ready to go back and ready to go back into practice. Um, and you can be the athletic trainer that says that, hey, take it a little easy, but if you have any questions, let me know. Obviously, if they're peeing Coca-Cola type urine, that's a, that's a do not stop go and, and you gotta shut that athlete down and get them tested. Hopefully that makes sense. It is it is a nuance because I feel like I'm in a doms like every day, right? All right, we've got a, a really interesting question here coming from Catherine. She says, as an athletic trainer in the military environment, she often comes across, and I, I presume SM refers to uh, one of the military uh, recruits um, with sickle cell trait, but also have G6PD, a uh, glucose yeah. 6 phosphate deficiency. Mm -hmm. When I suspect any kind of rhabdo, I refer to the lab per the protocol. But even if the levels are between 5 and 10,000, they won't diagnose with exertional rhabdo and they return them to training with no modifications, which I usually in turn modify on my own to mitigate further risk. How do I, as an athletic trainer, mitigate further potential detrimental effects, even when the uh, primary care folks won't keep them or do a follow-up level check, especially in a hot environment? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for asking that question. And this is why we wrote this clinical practice guideline. So I would basically um, respectfully ask your provider team, because again, Without even the sports medicine background, a lot of clinicians are not familiar with rhabdomyolysis, right? Even if those with sports medicine backgrounds. And so this is a unique um, event in um, athletic populations. And sometimes our soldier members or service members um, 
may not fit the bill of being a true athlete, right? So I say that because I am in the medical corps, right? Um, but in, in, in any sense, if you use that guidelines and take it to your leadership to say, hey, this is, I'm really concerned about this soldier or service member. And if you can talk to the, the doc, I think you can have a respectful conversation and you're doing the right thing by withholding them from practice. And bottom line, you're, you're basically using the guidelines. And um, it's really hard to go against uh, the guidelines from the uniform services and it's a tri-service guidelines and um, then you can have them call Dr. O'Connor <laughs> so, and he can get that to be straightened out. There's actually an email link to the Exertional Rhabdo group um, and that goes right into the CHAMP uh, um, uh, email box and we can, we can circle around with that leadership. And that's the type of leadership that we need from you on your level to then lead um, our physicians to take care of our service members and our athletes. So kudos to you, great job. Awesome. Perfect, well, those are the questions that we have at this point. So I do wanna thank everybody for attending. We do have uh, additional webinars coming up in the future. Um, and thank you, Dr. O, for sharing all of this great information tonight. I, I do appreciate it. And I know that everyone here is also appreciating it as well. Great, thank you, Michelle. And um, let me know if you have guys any questions and um, I think there's a quiz later on for you all to, to enjoy too, right? <laughs> okay. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions too, Michelle. Perfect, hope everyone has a great right. day. Signing out.